After weeks of violent protests, Kenya's government and opposition have agreed to hold negotiations. But will these discussions address the crisis faced by the people? Former US President Donald Trump has been indicted again. But will this affect his chances of running for president or even his popularity? And August 1st to August 7th is marked as World Breastfeeding Week. Why is this important and what are the challenges in this sector? These are the stories we'll be looking at in this episode of Daily Debrief. But before that, if you haven't hit that subscribe button, please do. Violent protests rocked Kenya throughout July after people were furious over new taxes that hit their incomes. Now, the most significant of these was the doubling of taxes on fuel. These measures were part of the Finance Act of President William Ruto and the protests were called for by opposition leader Raila Odinga, although a wide section of society participated. Close to 30 people were killed during these protests. Now, the government and opposition have reached an agreement to set up a committee to discuss various issues. But will this really address the concerns of the people? We have with us Brian Matenge of the Young Communist League of Kenya. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. So I think the news of the hour, so to speak, a couple of days ago, the government of William Ruto and opposition leader Raila Odinga setting up a committee to discuss all kinds of outstanding issues. So from your perspective, do you think that, you know, this is really going to address the kind of massive protests that took place in Kenya? Um, I don't think so, because, uh, uh, you know, what happened, what transpired, I think, is uh, uh, the ruling class, the current ruling class um, has... Uh, formed, uh, you know, they, 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 they have, uh, you know, an alliance that uh, uh, they have an alliance that they, they you know, that, that, that they, they discuss from. So I think it's still a bourgeois alliance. It's a, it's a, it's a ruling class alliance that is there to, you know, that is meant to protect their interests more and more. And I think, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, they took advantage of the fact that uh, the Kenyan masses were struggling. And, uh, you know, they could uh, identify that uh, most of uh, the people are addressing, uh, you know, key issues of survival, uh, bread, you know, the cost of uh, the high cost of living and such. So they used it to propel, uh, you know, their differences. But now we can see that uh, uh, they can uh, differ in, uh, you know, they can differ in positions, but uh, they never compromise on their interests. And uh, I think uh, the move is uh, strategies to... Uh, is purpose to keep protecting their interests. So I don't think it would uh, it will uh, garner any solutions to uh, the struggles of the struggling workers of uh, uh, Kenya. Right, Brian. Also, I think earlier we had a couple of instances of Odinga calling for protests, then reaching an agreement, then again protests take place, etc. But in the midst of all this, what has really happened is that I think the living conditions, like you said, of the people have bubbing are deteriorating considerably. The reports are quite shocking. So maybe could you take us through, you know, what has been the impact of the so-called reforms of this Finance Act? How is it affecting people's lives? Mm, one, I think um, uh, the Finance Act is uh, an exposition of, uh, of, uh, uh, um, of uh, you know, the structural adjustment programs uh, that have been imposed by the IMF and the World Bank. And, uh, you know, uh, you, we can see a lot of influence, uh, you know, from the external forces, the imperialist countries, supporting and uh, congratulating President Ruto for, for assenting the, the finance bill. But, uh, you know, look at it from, uh, you know, the onset, uh, the people that are most affected are uh, the working people, the working masses. And I think uh, that was uh, uh, one of the objective factors that led the people to protest. Um, uh, uh, in sense, I think uh, um, uh, the people are, uh, you know, are rallied by their own conditions, the conditions that are affecting them, the entire, you know, their intermediate needs. But uh, um, uh, I think now, even from the conversations and from the terms of uh, the discussions that uh, are are uh, are said to, you know, to to uh, to unite the, you know, both forces of the uh, of uh, you know the mainstream political divide. Um, uh, there are no uh, discussions about uh, the cost of living. There are no uh, discussions about uh, about uh, how uh, the Kenyans are going to access uh, the basic conditions of of, of living. So, um, I mean, uh, it, there, there is a there is an imperialist hand. There is a there is an imperialist uh, attempt 
to you know to you know to um you know, they are very connected with uh, you know with, with the national struggle that is ongoing about the finance act right brand also maybe could you take us through uh, you know what life is like every day right now in kenya because of the kind of reforms that have been imposed in terms of uh, the the immediate needs you talked about how is that kind of really on a day to day basis affecting the people um i think uh, they when we talk i think uh, reforms are necessary they are you know they should be there um you know um, because uh, you know we are still under capitalism but still uh, you know there are some reforms that are meant to you know that that, that, that are meant to keep the you know the, to, to keep the bourgeois operation afloat um like uh, for instance we are talking about the finance act uh which uh, you know that the life is uh, you know which makes life unbearable for the you know for the for the people of Kenya because uh, what it does is that uh, you know and you if you look at it closely it um it uh, it, you know, it, it gets to tax the basic commodities these things that uh, you know a person must need uh, you know to live and survive so it's really harsh and uh, you know uh, i think uh, the masses the the, the the people and the common people are uh, you know they, they, they get into the struggle uh, whether uh, consciously or subconsciously because of uh, you know uh, because of uh, an influence that comes from uh, you know this systemic oppression and one of them uh, i think uh, that is also hovering around the world and especially in the african continent is this one of the cost of living which uh, you know in the recent past we have witnessed uh, riots protests and insurrections from you know the various parts of the world and uh, you know what you can tell for sure is uh, you know the people uh, know you know you know that the people know this process they know they want a life of dignity and i think uh, you know that this uh, operation that uh, you know is continually imposed on, on them is uh, something that has led them to take up uh, to the streets and uh, you know demonstrate even if uh, most of uh, most of the insurrections and protests seem uh, not coordinated it's something that uh, uh, you know that uh, you, you know, we can re- it's a force that we can reckon and talk about it right brian thank you so much for speaking to us and giving us an insight into what's happening in kenya right now we'll hopefully get back to you for future episodes and analysis as well thank you so much former us president donald trump has been indicted for the third time now it's for plotting to overturn his loss in the 2020 elections the indictment is on four charges including conspiring to defraud the us government and obstructing an official proceeding earlier trump had been indicted on charges of mishandling secret documents and falsifying business records all this does not seem to have affected his popularity though he continues to be a huge hit among republican voters to understand this we go to anish anish yet another indictment yet another segment on daily debrief so but before we go into some of the details could you tell us a bit more about this specific indictment conspiring to overturn the results of the 2020 elections i suspect this was the one among the many charges which is probably the most serious yes so uh, the charges earlier charges actually uh, included an allegations i could not allegations per se but accusations uh, included uh, among other things uh, as you pointed out uh, uh, also included the attempt to overthrow the us government or uh, in, uh, you know inciting a rebellion now the thing is what is interesting about this case is that that charge hasn't come into the play in the current indictment because something of that sort if there is a, a proper uh, conviction uh especially if you are convicted of that is the only thing uh if the if you are convicted of uh, overthrowing the us government or rebellion uh you will be called disqualified from running the president that's the only thing that pretty much uh, disqualifies any person of your citizenship to run for uh, uh the presidency now the thing is that the current indictment does not obviously include that and so what you have right now is basically obstructing government uh, procedures obstructing uh the congress is working and stuff like that how and even you know uh, defrauding the us government so these are serious charges definitely it might even land him in jail if they can manage a conviction somehow uh which is also quite a far reach at this current point when we are looking at uh you know a republican dominated house and you know a half and half divided uh, senate it is still a far off uh, thing but still uh these are serious charges and even if he gets convicted it still doesn't Uh, prevent him from running for presidency so we are stuck in this situation where obviously he needs to be uh, tried and brought to justice on 
uh, the uh, current uh, charges, uh, which were serious, obviously, which tried to undermine a significant procedure of transfer of power. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is actually giving him significant level of leverage uh, in the, among the, at least among his constituents in the United States. Right, Anish, I guess uh, this brings uh, your answer, I think, brings us to really the second question, which is that recent polls showed that Trump is very much ahead when it comes to the Republican race at this point of time. So uh, the question that I think we always, many people across the world often wonder is that with the gravity of these charges, with the fact that, you know, his role in the <clears throat> January 6, 2021 incidents was pretty obvious. Why is it that, uh, you know, none of this has failed to really affect him in any way? Well, obviously, uh, he's created, I mean, he's also a product of it, but he has definitely uh, carved out a constituency for himself, which is quite a strong one, which has like millions of people at this point, uh, which believes in the conspiracy theories that he uh, peddled at the time of the, not only uh, at the time of the election, but before the election, he actually gave himself a bailout in the sense that he claim that there will be uh, vote, uh, voter frauding uh, uh, in uh, during uh, through the postal ballots and also during the election process and especially in democratic states. And a lot of people believe that. And that's the very sad reality that the U.S. is currently facing, that they're obviously the, uh, many of these people are uh, disaffected by and they have, you know, started uh, losing all sorts of trust in the U.S. government considering uh, successive governments having actually, uh, you know, made people's lives worse. But at the same time, uh, tapping into that and using it for a reactionary mode has actually benefited him. And that is where a, a problem. That is where the big problem comes in. You have to remember that even though he lost the uh, the previous general election, uh, he actually increased his vote share uh, significantly and also increased the number of votes he received by over a million. And so that creates a, a situation where we need to ask, like, obviously, there is a significant constituency. And even if tomorrow Trump doesn't win in the next general election, it is still going to be a, a, a battle ahead for anybody who uh, tries to replace him because uh, you have a, a divided political uh, situation where obviously stuff like this while needs to be debated it is going to take away attention from say daily bread and uh, butter issues at the same time you're having a situation where these people are not going to go away very easily because they continue to believe several significant levels of conspiracy and we saw that even in uh, during the covid pandemic which uh, and the kind of disaster that it created uh, when it came to counter pandemic efforts uh, so all of these factors definitely uh, come to play and uh, this is going to become a bigger challenge uh, and obviously a, a clear uh, growing deficit in, uh, you know, deficit of trust uh, in the U.S. Uh, system, the not just the democratic system as we keep calling it, but the U.S. system itself. Right, Anish, and I guess the question also is that as far as, uh, you know, the Democrats are concerned, they really don't have an answer to this as well because a lot of the cases also seem to be sort of, uh, like you said earlier, the attempt, uh, earlier it seemed like the attempt was to really uh, trap him in uh, these cases which would disqualify him for president. But according to you, the latest charges do not permit for that. So he still has a chance of running. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, like even if he gets convicted uh, before the elections will start, he still can, and he gets jailed uh, for any of these charges. He still can run for president. So that is how this is. The system allows it. The constitution allows it. And so, uh, in this current scenario, the Democrats have pretty much created a trap for themselves. They have given this person a political weapon where he can claim that he's being uh, politically hounded, even though the current set of all three uh, indictments are uh, based on serious evidence and serious issues that really need to be taken into consideration, for, especially for somebody who uh, is set to uh, regain a significant level of power in the U.S. government. So, uh, but at the same time, a lot of people believe that this is not going to happen because they see, and obviously he is spinning it in a manner uh, where he's, uh, he's, he pretends to be a martyr in many ways, and that is working in his favor. So it, uh, you know, we need to uh, wait and see if there is some kind of count, uh, you know, uh, counter from uh, the Democrats, or if uh, I mean, at some level, social movements have to come together and create a situation where 
such uh, notions and such uh, uh, you know conspiracy theories and everything uh, this climate this environment can be uh, you know undermined and in favor of considerations for say uh, rising cost of living uh, you know wage uh, uh, raising uh, minimum wages stuff like that uh, that actually affect millions and millions of uh, average americans and stuff like that which is not getting enough attention even to this day despite the level of uh, labor movement that uh, is that we see right now so these are things that really need to be uh, you know we need to wait and see how things turn out but obviously at the current point things for him is quite favorable right so much anish for the analysis i suspect we'll keep coming back to this issue like some of the other issues we come back again Uh, sometimes it's more of the same thank you so much for talking to us this year's world breastfeeding week is taking place from august 1st to august 7th with a focus on workplace policies that promote and support breastfeeding now breastfeeding comes with multiple health benefits for both children and women yet for a number of reason global rates are actually falling behind set targets we go to anna from the people's health movement for more anna thank you so much for joining us a very important week but uh, it's an interesting point i think to note that that uh, the rates are falling behind the targets and it seems in some senses maybe a bit counterintuitive so could you tell us some what are some of the factors including maybe uh, maybe an industry hand that is at play uh yes so uh, you know it's uh, quite an important week uh, that we uh, that we mark every year uh and of course it's something that um, breastfeeding is something that we have been uh, hearing about for for a very long time ab- about the benefits that brings uh now what you said you know that uh, the the levels uh, the, the global rates uh, of exclusive breastfeeding are falling behind the 2030 targets uh, is of course true so we are now at around 47 or 48% um compared to the 70% that um we should achieve that the world should achieve by 2030 um here what needs to be said is that you know uh the situation has somewhat improved compared to previous decades uh but we are still seeing that you know uh, uh there are some problems that seem not to go away uh although experts and public health um, uh, policy makers uh, continue to point them out and one of them is of course you know the role of the commercial milk formula industry that continues to be uh, very strong and continues to essentially uh, lure away both uh, both women but also health workers uh, from a focus on breastfeeding uh, and i think that you know uh, in the people's health dispatch uh, we have covered uh, the um, the recent analysis that has come up uh, come out on commercial milk fo- formula industry work and also marketing uh, over a couple of issues so you know for those who would like to uh, to learn a bit more about that i would uh, probably point them out to to the dispatch to read um but essentially what we are seeing uh, in this regard is that um, the industry is still very going very strong uh it's uh, not facing any kind of crisis although we do know that parents on the other hand are facing very much of a crisis uh if we uh, if we look at the US we know that there has been a formula shortage uh which has caused terrible impacts because the US has such low uh, low rates of uh, of breastfeeding so it essentially meant that babies went hungry and the family families had to travel for for miles and miles to to find the the formula brand that they they, they can afford uh on the other hand you know we we are also seeing that the industry is now kind of moving away from this focus on high income countries because in high income countries we are also seeing that uh mothers uh, and families are again turning to breastfeeding uh because of the health benefits that it brings uh, and instead are focusing on middle income countries uh where the market is still you know open to to the uh, to, uh, to their influences so um the industry is still there uh it's there it's still very impactful and very present at, at uh, global levels uh, and in shaping how uh breastfeeding policies uh are being uh, are being developed so it's definitely something that you know, know needs uh, very much attention and very much uh, focus on in in uh, as also world breastfeeding week continues and well, also sort of expanding the discussion just to kind of also think through you know what about maternal health care especially the the context of the workplace which seems to be the focus this year so how does it sort of tie into the week uh yes and again uh you know this we uh, this year the focus is uh, essentially on protection in the workplace so on all that all those policies that 
uh, governments should have in place so pe- uh, so uh, so mothers once they go back to work or when they give birth uh, they have access to support and they can actually and practically uh, initiate breastfeeding uh, so uh, that uh, the world health organization and unicef c- have come out with a statement uh, outlining you know the the main points uh, that should be covered by these policies and what they say of course is you know uh, mandatory maternity leave at least 18 weeks uh, and possibly six weeks, uh, sorry, six months, uh, ideally at least six months. So this is something that not, uh, not all countries have. Some countries have it much shorter, so um, up to 12 weeks, for example. Uh, and it's important to, you know, to outline how these kind of policies impact the possibility of women uh, actually breastfeeding the, their children. Uh, and what it what it usually turns out to be is that uh, if you're forced to go to back to the workplace too soon, uh, you're not able to um, you're not able to continue breastfeeding even if you have started it. Uh, and this again uh, brings you back to the formula and uh, brings you back to the health uh, uh, health risks that uh, the consumption of formula can can have in respect to uh, to breastfeeding. So this is one of the things that uh, they have been advocating for. They have, they have also been advocating for uh, the WHO and UNICEF uh, for uh, workplaces which allow for breastfeeding uh, and paid breaks. So it's something to to expand a bit on uh, when uh, uh, when the when the mothers return to the workplace that they actually do have the resources uh, to continue continue the practice. Right. Thank you so much, Anna, for I think that very important input. Uh, something that. Uh, in some senses is I think uh, should be common sense but actually is not as uh, simple as it seems a lot of complications including the role of the industry thank you so much for explaining that to us and that's all we have in today's episode we'll be back with more episodes in the coming days dealing with many such issues from across the world but in the meantime do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you can watch more episodes of Daily Debrief (laughs) 